Welcome to this video on object-oriented programming in JavaScript. Object-oriented programming, the notion of wrapping our data and functionality in objects, is the heart of many modern programming languages. JavaScript gives us the ability to emulate many of those features as well. But to do it properly, we have to understand the distinct implementation style of JavaScript object-oriented programming. And we're going to discover that rests on understanding features like the prototype chain, like this underscore proto underscore reference. Get those down and the meaning behind the class keyword, the new keyword, all those favorite questions in seasoned developer interviews become much more accessible to us. So join us in this video as we go deep on how OOP works in JavaScript and become the proficient developers who can implement those features in our own professional code. Object-oriented programming. Mm. A hugely popular paradigm of writing our code at scale. When I'm no longer writing 100 lines, 500 lines, 1,000 lines of code, but instead tens of thousands of lines of code, and I have hundreds of developers working on my code base with me, I need a way of structuring it, of organizing it, that is a couple of things. One, easy for me to add features and functionality to it, maybe as another developer, without breaking what was already there. Two, when another developer picks up my code, they can reason about it and sort of see the layout and easily understand what's going on. That's both just because it follows a certain set of standards, but hopefully also because it's structured in a way that is meaningful uh, given the needs that I'm going to have in my code base. We'll see what that means later on. And finally, that it's performant. Is my means of structuring my code going to be efficient is it going to allow me to do uh, as much as I can without taking as many steps as I can or without using up uh, inefficiently a huge amount of memory space at the expense, at this expense of performance? So object-oriented programming says, let's think about what we do when we write code. Essentially, we do two things. We store data in memory and we apply functionality to data. In its heart, that's what we do when we write code. We store information, data, and we apply functionality to it. Now, don't get me wrong, it gets really complicated with lots of different functionality and lots of different data, but essentially we are writing functionality and data, and we're applying functionality to data. Think about a user who's got a score in a quiz game. I'm going to apply the functionality of increasing score to that user's um, score data, the value of their score. Given that, our object-oriented programming paradigm says, okay, if what we're really doing is just writing uh, functionality to apply to data, and there's lots of functionality that applies to this bit of data, and there's lots of functionality that applies to this bit of data, could we somehow think of that uh, challenge in terms of some structure? And what might that structure be? We're going to see in a second. Now, I will tell you this. Whereas with our functional programming, our high order functions, our closures, those we can very quickly see with a single function how valuable it is. It is very easy to see that map, copy array and manipulate, makes the life of writing out copy array and multiply by two, copy array and divide by two, copy array, much easier than writing all those functions out. So we instantly see the value of passing in a callback function. Uh, an additional set of instructions at the calling of the higher order function. OOP is not as easy to see its inherent value until we are dealing with complexity at scale. So we're going to have to play a little bit of a sort of imaginary game of building an application at scale. We're going to build a quiz game. It's going to have users, and there, here we only have two users, name Will score three, name Tim score six. But imagine this thousands of users all playing simultaneously with maybe many different data, many different properties associated with each user. A score, an avatar, a, you know, a home page, a time zone, a, a login state or a log out state, all these sort of pieces all attached to each individual user. And a ton of functionality that can be applied to each of these users. Here we've only got the ability to increase score, but we could have, you know, Log in, log out, 
uh, change avatar, add avatar, delete avatar, delete profile, uh, you know, hundreds of different pieces of functionality that every single user, remember I said code is about, writing code is about writing functionality to apply to data, you know, every single user, all this data, uh, we want all that functionality to be available. Because if all I'm doing when I write, when I write code is applying functionality to data, well then wouldn't it be great if all the functionality that I could ever want to apply to this user data is there right adjacent somehow. We'll see what that means, but somehow packaged up, bundled up, so that I know always that the relevant functionality will be there for my relevant data. Well, what would be the best way of somehow wrapping, bundling up the relevant functionality that could ever be applied to the pertinent data at that moment? Or could, how could we bundle those things up? Lewis? Uh, possibly in an object. Possibly in an object. And that is the heart of our object-oriented paradigm. It's saying the best way to structure what we're essentially doing with write code, which is applying functionality to data, the best way to structure that is to bundle the relevant functionality and associate it directly with the relevant data in objects. Note that we can have a whole bunch of different relevant functionality in, in reality, hundreds of these different functions. But in our essence, we are storing functions with their associated data on objects so that we can do this thing here. Oh man, if we can do this thing here, we are so happy. If I can run my relevant function, in this case, the ability to increment the score of my relevant data the user one score property, then I am so happy. This makes my code super easy for someone else to reason about. Where's the relevant functionality for this user object? Oh, don't worry, there it is associated and I can just run the function right to the right hand side of the dot. That goal of having my functionality and data bundled together, everything we're gonna to see today is going to be about achieving that goal. Can I get my relevant functionality on my relevant data? If I can do that, everything else follows. That's gonna be my fundamental goal the whole rest of this session. And we're gonna start a very simple way of bundling the functionality and data together. Literally, we created one here by wrapping them using object literal. When you define an object by itself, it's called an object literal. We're going to discover there's more and more sophisticated ways and that when we do it in certain early versions, there's trade-offs, there's costs of doing it that make, yes, it's very intuitive, very simple. Again, goal, object, containing data and functionality bundled as one, but there's going to be big downsides. But we're never going to lose sight that our fundamental goal in the entire session is can we achieve calling the relevant functionality on the relevant data. For example, user one dot increment. Is my functionality right there to the right hand side of my data? This is an encapsulation, binding together the data and functionality that manipulates that data, binding it together in a bundle. This is known as encapsulation. We're going to see a couple of ways of creating objects just so we get familiar with a few different uh, means of defining our objects. What's another way? Here I've declared a fully populated object literal. Skylar, what's another way I can? I could have created this user one object. You could have set an empty object. Empty object and? Uh, populated. With what, what type of notation? Dot or bracket. Dot notation, yeah, exactly. Let's see it. Dot notation. Create an empty object and then assign its properties using dot notation. Uh, let's just do this one, talk through it line by line to make sure we're clear. Skylar. So first we're going to declare a variable user2. Yep. Set that equal to an empty object. Yep. Okay, then we're going to access that empty object and store a key with name. Yep. That's assigned to the string Tim. Yep. Then we're going to access the same object score and set that equal to six. Right. I obviously do not know this very well. Yeah, six, exactly. Yep. And then we're going to add a function on this key, which is called a method. Yeah, exactly. Increment, which increments the user two. Yeah, so we have an increment property known as a method because it's a function. Exactly, excellent. Now, are we calling increment here? No. No, we're just defining, we're just adding. Now we fill out all our properties, excellent. Now you said we can also fill it out with square bracket notation. I want to stress, bracket notation is never used except in one vital condition. What is that one vital condition, Lewis? 
um, when you're trying to evaluate what goes in. Oh, when you're trying to evaluate what's going to be the property. Yeah, exactly. Where I want to essentially leave, so user two, I could have, I don't know, uh, property, um, and then this is a an unknown right now. It's going to be evaluated when I hit this line. I'm going to look in memory for property and find that maybe property is name. So this is where I want to eva I want to leave it unknown yet for now. It's a variable. I want to you know, have my property to be determined at the point I hit that line. So it's about handling variables that are going to then evaluate to an individual property name. At no other time. Now, if your property name has a space, or begins with a number or a special character, fine. You need to use you know, square brackets to do uh, two. So I, I can't, yeah, here you go, something like that. But if you ever have a property name that is that, you've got bigger problems than <laughs> using square bracket notation. So you're never going to use square bracket except for when you're always going to use it, which is with variables. Perfect. All right, top notation. Who can tell me another way of declaring an object? It's going to declare an empty object. It's using a built-in feature of JavaScript. Mijan, do you know another way of creating an empty object? Uh, there's the object.create. There's the object.create. Fantastic, Mijan, spot on. That's exactly it. Using object.create. Well, this line here at the top here, user 3, well, tell me, uh, Philip, what's this line at the top here going to do? It's going to create an empty object. User 3 is set as a variable on the left-hand side, and it's going to have assigned to it the return value. Mm. Return value, I'm sure it's where it's saying that. Object or create called is going to return an empty object. It's going to give us out of this an empty <coughs> object. Now, you see the little null being passed in. We're going to see that you can pass anything. You can pass an object in with a thousand properties. It's still always going to return us an empty object. By the end of this top line here, we have exactly the same thing as the top line here, user2 is an empty object. Well, hmm. with a slight under the hood difference we're going to see later on. User3 is an empty object. So keep talking me through it, Philip. Um, and then we access the user3 object, creating a property name yep. and assigning it the string Eva. Yep. Um, same thing, uh, access the user3 object, giving it a score property and assigning it the number 9. And then accessing the same object, giving it an increment uh, property and giving it a function. Yeah, so the method increment. What are we noticing here? We're, we're handwriting out each of our objects here. Is this, is this uh, sustainable? No. We're doing something very repetitive. Z, what do we do when we have repetitive code? What do we usually do to avoid repeating ourselves? Write functions. We write functions. Functions are what save us from writing things again and again. Functions are wrapping up instructions to then be used. Hopefully they're general enough. They can be used for each, each circumstance. They can be used again and again. Write them once, call them many times. Very powerful for that. Yes, yeah, so we've got millions of users. We can't be having the developers handwriting out each of the user objects behind the scenes as soon as you start playing. I, I always imagine that. No, we can't do that. We instead wrap our creation of an object in a function. And then we can run that function and fill in the individual properties and then return out that object and store it in a variable. This is our first solution. If all we want to do, which we do, is be able to run our functionality, our relevant functionality on the relevant data. User 1 represents our relevant data with score property. In name will score 3. And then our relevant functionality increment that data. If all we want to do is that, then this is going to solve our problem. Solution 1 is going to be a beautiful solution. Super intuitive. But it is going to be fundamentally unusable. But we are going to see it so we can understand why it's fundamentally unusable.